Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Welcome to the uh, research track here at the OpenSIM uh, Community Conference in, of 2003. I would like to introduce our speaker today, Austin Tate. Austin Tate is Director of the Artificial Intelligence Applications Institute and holds the Personal Chair of Knowledge Based Systems at the University of Edinburgh. He is Coordinator for the Virtual University of Edinburgh and runs the OpenView Open Simulator Grid. I, Austin, is Professor Tate's avatar representing the Virtual University of Edinburgh. This presentation explores support in a training orient orientated iZone augmented by intelligent systems technology with the aim of providing a virtual space for intelligent scenario based learning. I has provided online resources to accompany the presentation and to assist if there are any technical problems in seeing his slides. They are accessible via http colon slash atate.org slash oscc13. I will also put that down in text. If you have any questions during the presentation, I am them to me. Uh, I will uh, speak them you know, in the stream to uh, Austin and he will answer. Okay, so over to you, Austin. Thank you, Shirley. And thanks for joining us in this session. Um, as Shirley explained, there is a URL available for resources to do with this talk. Uh, that'll be persistently available after the session as well. So for those of you watching on a recorded stream, you can also use the URL that Shirley just mentioned. Um, I'll, I'll be, it'll be on the next slide too for those of you that want to see that. Um, there's a little poster to the right hand side of the main screen showing and for those of you in world, if you click that, it'll take you to the URL. So just to give a little bit of background, um, I decided to take a little bit of time out and go back to study myself. So I became a student last year. Uh, I was I did the MSc in e-learning delivered via via by, by distance education methods at the University of Edinburgh in our school own school of education. I did that really to improve my own experience of distance education and methods for distance education because I'm the coordinator of that for our own school of informatics. But this dissertation gave me an opportunity to, to look through a, a number of things that have been interesting me over the years in my own work, which is mostly in artificial intelligence. And I'm going to give you a bit of a context of uh, what we're working on and why and the application areas in this talk. The talk itself principally follows the work I did in my MSc dissertation. And this let me organize a number of threads and put together a number of resources which we're now using with our own PhD and MSc students at Edinburgh. So it's partly a, a, an exercise in collecting materials and uh, partly an exercise in trying to do a specific project within this space of interest to me. Uh, you'll see why the title is, is, uh, is there, this activity in context, and I'll explain what I mean by that as we go along. Uh, but effectively, this see this as a report on my own MSc work in in the and the dissertation for that. The URL is on there: http colon slash slash dot org slash oscc thirteen. As I said, I'll leave that persistently available as a short URL to get access to the materials. It also gives access to the dissertation itself. I'll I'll remind you of that at the end of the talk. So let's make a start. My own area of interest is really in mixed initiative approaches to education. That's where the tutor and the student work together, each taking initiative at appropriate times. I want to see that supported by intelligent systems in all sorts of tutorial modes. And uh, uh, some of the particular areas I've been working in are not in higher education, they're in training uh, for virtual res uh, for emergency responders and other people who are involved in professional training situations. So by mixed initiative, what I mean is that the various agents can take the lead on the initiative and interaction at appropriate times. So this is in contrast to tutor-guided learning or student discovery-based learning. It's intended to be that rich mix uh, that lets people work together in a learning environment. 
So I'm interested in how scenario-based training and learning works. What's the most effective way to support learners in some of these professional learning contexts? And my, my, my research work has mostly been funded from US sources working in a range of areas with civilian and military emergency responders, especially where they're working together, civilian and military teams. Now, the slide I'm going to show you here is what I'm going to spend a little bit of time on. Um, if you can't see the slide, the resource link I gave you uh, lets you bring up a copy uh, and you can follow along in a browser, you know, outside of the window if you want to. But I will read out what the, the, the key elements of uh, what, this, what, what this flow diagram has on it. So it's a flow diagram of areas I explored during my thesis work. And... I'm just going to bring up an overlay um, to give you a, a, an idea what the areas marked in red are the parts I'm mostly going to discuss in this in this talk and the ones that were of most interest to me from an AI perspective in the artificial intelligence perspective in the work that I was doing. So what I did was was really look at what I wanted to to have a, a driver for this which was the the need for more effective ways of of supporting community oriented training sessions we've got a community of people who are meant to be exploring a, a space for something they're going to do either professionally or in their in their work lives and we're trying to help them through scenarios uh, explore this space and understand how the, some of the procedures work in the space I'm just bringing up my own copy of that. Okay. So what I was looking at was some of the cognitive psychology roots that underpins situated learning, social learning, and learning in areas where you've got a rich scenario, a rich environment uh, for, uh, sorry, what, uh, uh, thank, thanks Beth for putting that, that uh, link up there. Um, Yes, yeah, so some of these cognitive psychology roots I was exploring. Now, this work has been going on for quite some time. Of course, there's a lot to do with uh, situated learning, social learning, discovery-based learning. And I, I actually had studied some of this 40 years ago when I did my own undergraduate degree, where I did a little bit of uh, education psychology work in that. It was many years, even though I would do work in artificial intelligence, uh, I, it was many years since I really had, had read more up-to-date readings and more, more up-to-date texts on this area. So this gave me an opportunity to come up to speed on that. Uh, it helps my own students now with, uh, with being able to interact with them. But it, it let me come up to date with some of the terminology in this area, and in particular to start to see that people had been using all sorts of interesting um, observations of how you can explore joint activity. And activity fits closely to my own area of artificial intelligence, and I'm going to draw that out in a, in a, in a moment. But there's quite interesting work on, on how the world itself in a training environment or a learning environment can constrain what you can do. A knowledge in the world or affordances which allow you to constrain what's possible in the, in the learning environment that you're working in. So I was exploring that. So what I was trying to do was understand how people model learning objectives and how they use those in designing their, their educational programs and their training programs, how you can use community knowledge in a social learning context, and how you can use a model of the world scenario, the world state of the scenario, to give you a constrained set of choices so that the learning is directed in some way. What I wanted to do was try to show that there's a, there could be an underlying representation of those that you could actually do some reasoning about while you were doing this kind of joint learning to start to get the idea that intelligent systems could be brought to bear in this learning environment. And in particular, because of my own background interests and research interests in AI planning, 
and plan representations in particular and shared plan representations for human and system agents. I wanted to see that many of those objectives, community knowledge and state information could be represented using the sorts of plan representations that we're familiar with in artificial intelligence. Uh, so that's the first of these red marked, the, 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 the shaded box. The representation of agents, plans, activity and state was a requirement that was driven by this psychological background that let me explore what I was already doing in a more technical sense uh, with AI plan representations, but being able to draw that back and link it back to terminology now in, in, in use in the educational cognitive psychology area. But what I then wanted to do was show that you could bring that to bear on designing scenarios for training in this mixed initiative fashion. And for that, I use roadmaps. And I'm going to come back to a slide or two on these uh, to explain them in a little bit more detail. So I wanted to use roadmaps that let you map learning objectives to possible ways you could constrain the world situation in order to give people challenges within that constrained world to give them a learning environment where they could explore, use procedures, use their background training, and explore an environment where they had to make choices inside the training area, inside the training facility, or inside the training tutorial room. So I wanted to have learner activities we wanted to drive, and events that which were occurring that were giving them some sort of constrained set of choices. And this became the, the, the core of the, the dissertation work, this, this making of choices in a constrained fashion. Hence the term activity in context. I wanted the learners to discover the activities they could take in the context they were in and the constrained context that we put them in through in injecting appropriate events into that domain. And this is, as you'll see, a typical way that, uh, that learning and training groups do work in, when they're training people for these kind of professional environments. But then the back end of this, and we'll come on to this towards the end of the talk, is that I wanted to then experiment with a facility inside a virtual world, inside OpenSim, that allowed us to um, uh, create one of these training environments, which was more like an operations center for people to take decisions in an emergency response context. And uh, we'll come on to that shortly. So I'm going to just move off that, off that uh, flowchart slide now uh, and move on. So... Mixed initiative training is what really the, is the focus of the work. And I wanted to bring a number of threads together, as I said, of work that I've been doing over the years. And this gave me an opportunity to sit down, explore some of this, and do quite a lot of background reading that, uh, that I'd not really had the chance to do before I concentrated on doing this dissertation. Uh, I wanted to study, as I said, the cognitive psychological foundation for situated social learning. I wanted to identify effective learning methods relevant to the mixed initiative interaction between agents that interested me and to discover the relationship between those cognitive psychological activity models and the more research, AI research uh, uh, oriented conceptual models of activity that I've been working on, especially in some of the uh, standards activities for representing plans and processes. Um, and then to look at a methodology for how you might use these to design training scenarios and training environments where you could use some of this background to give a more effective training oriented zone of work and we call this an i zone and you'll see that that's this links to previous work i've done on things called i rooms which are intelligent rooms for interaction so we're trying to create this virtual space for intelligent scenario based interaction that i call an i zone for the purpose of this of this dissertation work and what I wanted to do, as I mentioned at the start of the talk, was create, document, and demonstrate a resource base for experimentation and potential reuse in this area uh, so that other students, uh, other people, could pick up the resources. And the URL we've given you before does point to the places where a lot of the resources and demonstrations and videos are available. Um, the relevant psychological, uh, the relevant educational psychology itself, I aren't really covering in this talk at all. If you're interested in this, the dissertation itself has a couple of chapters which do go into this in a bit more detail and draw out why certain themes are interesting to me. Uh, but it is to do with communities, it's to do with action and change in communities and how you can use the power of a, of, of a scenario or a story inside a scenario uh, to, to, to give really good motivation to learners and give them an understandable and constrained environment within which, which they can learn. 
And then I just wanted to touch on the, the fact that there has been, of course, a lot of artificial intelligence in educational learning systems to date. Indeed, going right back to the beginnings of, of AI, there were attempts to put, put, uh, create intelligent learning environments using artificial intelligence technology. And again, the thesis goes into details of this in the chapter, and it gives kind of summaries and literature reviews that give an overview of why this stuff's important and how the last 20 years of work in this area has updated what was in some of the early textbooks of the 1970s. Uh, so I would just point you at the at the dissertation, there's a PDF of the dissertation online if you're interested in that aspect yourself. But I wanted to use AI-inspired models of activity and in particular we use an ontology we call Inca uh, to underpin all of the representations we have of plans, activities, processes, agent capabilities, and uh, agent interactions. And this ontology is a very simple one, and it underpins some of the, the standards available now, uh, uh, available through National Institute Standard Technology in the US, for instance, and things which have become, um, have become international standards. There's a, there's a core ontology of some of those international standards, which is itself inspired by some of the work that's gone on in a range of communities, but including the AI community. And I've been involved in some of the activities like uh, the MIT Process Handbook, uh, the Process Interchange Format that was part of that, and then the later work where all those groups came together with people from industry to work on the uh, National Institute for Standards and Technology um, process specification standards and they uh, themselves led to one of the ISO standards. But this core ontology is a simpler thing, it's an abstractly simple description of activity and the INCA stands for issues, nodes, constraints and annotations. And it's meant to be a very simple underlying ontology on which you can base many of these representations. So plans, processes, capability models can, can be represented as a set of issues, a set of activity nodes, a set of constraints on those activity nodes, and a set of annotations that underlie what the process or the model or the plan is about. And typically there we might catch a rationale behind it and its purposes and its links to objectives and agents. So this underlying ontology has been around for a long time. Um, as, uh, it's something I've worked on for many years, but a number of other communities have perhaps differently phrased versions of this, but these core ontologies have been around in planners for decades, AI planners for decades. Um, and I wanted to use the, the abstract mo models that underlie these representations to see if we could map it across into these themes that were coming out of the uh, mixed initiative learning environment work. So in particular, I want to find ways to map learning objectives to appropriate learner activities. And that's where the road mapping come in. But I want to do it in such a way that you could have partial reasoning about that. Uh, and that's why these, these underlying properly ontologically based plans are important to the way I operate. And then, as I said, relate the educational plans and what you're trying to achieve in a, in a learning sense uh, on, be, on behalf of the learners. Um, you want to map that to the the plans of the domain, the, the, the description of what's happening in the scenario itself. So it makes sense in scenario terms. And that's what the roadmaps offer in the dissertation approach and the methodology that I was trying to develop here and that we'll summarize uh, you know, as we go along in a minute. But then I wanted to use AI planning methods to actually compose some of these learning episodes. So you could have partial creation of learning episodes in an intelligent learning space uh, done semi-automatically rather than having having teams of people write those scenarios and drive those scenarios. So the roadmaps are something that typically do occur. Uh, you, you find them in uh, professional businesses and government agencies. Uh, many of the large scale programs in DARPA, for instance, in, in military research in the US, all have these roadmaps of what they're trying to achieve and typically what you find in a roadmap is that you've got a set of requirements coming in and you've got a set of uh, uh, proposed experiments and proposed research projects or things you're going to do. And what you're trying to do is relate those and show how if you work on certain aspects of, of demonstrations or feasibility demonstrations and things of that kind, if you work on those, they achieve both your objective and demonstrate a technology. And typically the aim is for the people proposing technical experiments and technical projects and seeking funding for that to try to relate that to the objectives of the overall program. 
Uh, and I've been on programs where I, I've been a program manager uh, alongside other program managers where we use the roadmap to drive what we try to uh, get out of the different, uh, the different projects that people are proposing. So we encourage them to try to write nodes of these roadmaps. So they do show that they're meeting a requirement that feeds back to the potential future requirements and future opportunities of using their technology. But they're also showing their, their work well. They're demonstrating their work well by finding an appropriate node on the roadmap, an appropriate thread in, in a particular demonstration we're doing. And I was trying to use this in uh, relating learner objectives to some of the uh, situated actions that we want to try to encourage in the learning zone. So all of this is grounded in the fact that I'm interested in emergency response and in particular operation centers for controlling events during an emergency. So remember here we're not trying to simulate what's going on out in the field where people are in police cars or in ambulances or fire or they're landing in boats or they're dealing with the tsunami on the ground and you're looking at the at the layout of the land. You saw some of that in Krista's talk yesterday for instance where they're very interested in the terrain and how you simulate uh, elements of the terrain itself because there you're trying to put uh, the simulation onto the agents or the avatars representing agents or onto the vehicles involved and onto the physical infrastructure. Here it's different, we're in a closed building uh, t typically, it, it, it could just be a set of walls that we've got, and we're not even seeing outside. Everything that's coming in is coming in via video feeds or uh, radio messages, um, messaging and TV and so on, internet. And typically, we're in a cl closed room. Often, it could be in a secure closed room. It could be a bunker in a facility that's meant to survive earthquakes or, or tsunamis or whatever. Now, I've got some pictures here. These are pictures taken in uh, the Emergency Response Center for the Tokyo Metropolitan Government. Uh, which I was able to, to, to visit and show and talk about the, some of the work we're doing and look at the way their response center works. And this has multiple levels. It has every level from dealing with the public through telephone calls, um, through a command center where the more technical people sit and watch what's going on with their sensor grids and watch what's happening with tsunami water levels and so on, uh, right up to... Uh, 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 an area where the mayor of, the, of Tokyo can sit with military advisors and can take decisions and is briefed. And uh, there's a few pictures just uh, in, the, in the slide set here showing what's going on with the emergency response center at Tokyo. Um, there, are even, there are even mobile versions of these operation centers. Titan Corporation in America, for instance, make a truck uh, typically bought by people like FEMA in America the Federal Emergency Management Agency, um, and these can be sent out into areas which have been devastated with a natural or, or man-made disaster um, and can become mobile emergency response centers, setting up temporary uh, communications, w uh, traffic, and so on. And you, you typically will turn up with a truck like that and it'll act as the emergency response set center and coordination center for the, the core in the field emergency responder. And we see these in Britain for our fire brigades, for instance, all our fire brigades have a control truck uh, for emergency response coordinators, which is something like that. That's a picture of myself and my colleague Gerhard Wickler who's, who's sat inside the, the Titan truck. So you can see it's, it's a closed environment again. We're taking video feeds, we're doing briefings, we're taking decisions, and we're trying to do the best in an area we have. And the picture on the right shows a future emergency response operations center concept that was uh, worked on under DARPA program that I was involved in to do with the planning initiative. So these sort of operation centers are meant to be what we do. Now, what I'm interested in is training these centers. So these are pictures of something uh, which is the, the Personnel Recovery and Education Training Center, PRETC, at Fredericksburg in Virginia, USA. And this is a training center where people are going to become emergency responders or are going to be coordinators in real emergency response and search and rescue situations that typically train before they're deployed. And what's typically going on here is that someone's acting as a, as a, as a main search and rescue coordinator uh, and they're dealing with all sorts of distributed centers, which in real life in the training center are just in, along the corridor, but are meant to be potentially distributed across the world or, or across different agencies or in different centers and at different levels of authority. And then typically at the end of the corridor, you've got a, a bunch of guys and a bunch of women who are, who are sitting in something called the white cell uh, where they drive the simulation, they drive the scenario, they have maps, they, th they know what's going on, 
the search and rescue people don't. They know where they're going to have accidents or emergencies or problems or where an airman is going to ditch an aircraft. And they're working on this and trying their best to, to generate this dynamic scenario um, in order that the people inside the search and rescue training coordination room and the distributed rooms are driven to try out their procedures, understand what to do, and work well to the situation that's dynamically unfolding. Now, of course, sometimes uh, the people in the training centers work on it very easily and solve it all nice and easily, so they don't really get much out of the learning experience. So the white cell is there to dynamically adapt the situation to make it awkward, to deliberately uh, cause realistic confusion, for instance, where there may be mistakes over things like call signs of, of of the pilots involved so that you kind of get it to the point where you think it might be the case that only one airman has been ditched in the water when in reality it was because of a confusion over call signs and some confusion over reporting and this sort of thing typically happens so, so they've got this environment where they basically are a white cell a main coordinator and the main people being trained and they all typically take a turn in that room to, when, while they're being trained. And then you've got these other co distributed coordination centers so people see the problems of being underneath the control of someone and seeing problems of uh, procedures either being followed or not followed. So this is the kind of context and we've worked for a few years with groups like the PRETC in Fredericksburg deploying some of our systems in experimental fashion. Um, so what I wanted to do was bring all that together and then try to create a, a virtual space for this kind of intelligent training where you could actually try out that same sort of training. You could have the white cell partially automated and you could try to generate dynamic learning episodes for people who are going to work in this sort of uh, uh, training situation. And it's a multi-level um, experiment environment and I, I direct you at the at the uh, MSc dissertation if you want a bit more detail, a bit more explanation of why I've got these levels. But what I'm dealing with is the people involved, the agents involved, and the environmental objects involved, the things which are actually, uh, uh, let's say, sensor grids in the field or things they, they could be the, things like water level uh, sensors in a tsunami situation or things that you're getting reports from. So I wanted to both have a level of that that was inside a virtual space that's been simulated but also to link up with real external training people and this is typically what happens in these environments you have some people who are outside the training environment who are operating in a physical environment and some people who are in the training environment and being given the opportunity to interact with the people outside in order that they can get that realism of feedback and some some sort of realism about what's going on and it means it constrains the kind of actions they can take because there is this physical tie back to it. It's not all something that just can be stopped and restarted. Time really flows. You can't just say, stop now, I need to, I need to think about this for an hour. Something will happen during that hour in the environment, which means if you're too late, then the situation's changed and you've got to appreciate that. So this iZone that was working on is based on some work we've already done on iRooms, as we call them, which are virtual spaces for intelligent interaction. These are pictures of, uh, of iRooms inside, uh, inside OpenSim, and we have similar things in Second Life. And we can deploy these you know, within a few seconds out of inventory. They can be connected up to, um, to intelligent systems of various kinds, including AI planning systems, which can support uh, standard operating procedures and suggest courses of action. They can be connected up to external augment, uh, reasoning and argumentation systems. Um, and there's been quite a bit of work on this, and we've reported on it on, in, in uh, journals such as IEEE Intelligent Systems and IEEE Internet Computing. So I'd direct you at some of the papers that are referenced in the, in the paper for this session if you're, if you're interested. Uh, but, but this is typically where people are coming together, they're brainstorming, and they're working through problems, and they're trying to come, come up with courses of action. Uh, so we're typically looking at the issues involved uh, uh, with our methodology, uh, looking at the events occurring, trying to make sense of that, and then generating options for course, courses of action that we'd like to carry out and argument, having argumentation and discussions on the pros and cons of, of looking at of, of taking one of those particular courses of action. And then we're kind of doing briefings on the sensible courses of actions to typically uh, people in authority uh, to try to get their approval, but also to explain what their options are. Uh, and then we're often actually enacting that either in a simulated training situation or in real life. 
And these control centers are meant to be for where you have distributed teams rather than all in one location and you're trying to bring them together and you're trying to use the centers. So as I said, I'll point you at other work uh, on these iZones for the, 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 the papers that have been written to give you a flavor of what's going on there. Um, just to just to let you know that we've not just used these in emergency response situations. These same iRooms have been used with companies who, for instance, do multimedia game production. We've worked with Slam Games in Glasgow on what is really a, a, an iRoom for creating games over a long period of time, say three, four months, where people are talking about multimedia products and other things and uh, meeting up with people in different countries who are doing artwork and music. But they have this persistent space where they can discuss the game and its evolving design and the materials around them. And one of the other more fun uses of this was to create something called the Virtual World of Whiskey. It's a, a, a Scotch whiskey tutored tasting room um, where you can go in and interact with people who are doing tutored tastings in real life uh, and interact with them in, in the virtual world to have tutored tastings. And some of the automated systems behind this can control the screens, can show clips of videos, can bring up pictures of the processes of making whiskey, um, can can use all sorts of other uh, things. And there's a YouTube video, if you want to look up on YouTube, Virtual World of Whiskey, you can see a, U a YouTube video of us doing a Burns Night tutored tasting using our iRoom, where we're interacting in a mixed initiative fashion between a real tutor who was, who was giving a tutored tasting down in London, uh, who was a director of a whiskey company, and he was working with people, then watching him and interacting with him in Second Life. And the systems behind the scene are using a knowledge base of 15,000 facts that they could use, a semantic web knowledge base uh, of facts about whiskey, and it was volunteering that information at appropriate times. It had a natural language generation system that could let the assistants in the room uh, do paragraph-length composition of information that they could offer to the tutor to give to the audience. Uh, and it also had the standard operating procedure support and tutored support and expla explanation of other processes um, by using the what we call the IX uh, AI planning system. So all that kind of technology existed and I was bringing it together for some of the work that you're now seeing in the iZone. And we wanted to bring this together by embodying it in someone that could look like a tutor. Uh, so if you see one iAustin in front of you, this is four iAustins that we had here and these are all NPC bots um, inside OpenSim, uh, cloned off my own appearance, but all with the, they're all holding a little tablet uh, as an attachment. And the little thing that looks like an iPad or Android tablet is actually an attachment that lets it con the, the NPC or the bot connect up to these external knowledge-based systems, intelligent agent systems. Um, so it can connect up to our IX planning systems, but it could also connect up to chatbot systems like Pandora bot, Alice bots. In particular, we connected this to the My Cyber Twin uh, chatbot technology. And what we had there is an ability both to chat and to use the intelligent agent to decide what to inject into the area. So this gave us an embodiment and a framework for delivering some of the ideas that I've been showing you uh, during, this, during this talk. So remember that I was really trying to create resources here for students to be able to take and use and move forward with. These same chatbots now with that little attachment can control the artifacts in this room as well as chatting into the room and chatting to the people who are being trained and injecting things into the scenario and acting like a colleague or a, an assistant however you want to see it inside this training space they're really becoming the equivalent of that white cell of trainers i mentioned this this avatar could be thought of as one of the team members but deliberately trying to constrain and cajole and inject events into the training environment to make sure we're achieving our learning environments, our learning objectives. And this same bot can, through chat to various devices in the room, control things like the screens and the incoming messaging and other things. So they can be a bit more like the Starship Enterprise sort of uh, a computer where you can ask it to do things for you or ask it how you might do things or ask it to generate a plan of action or call up a standard procedure that you may have forgotten. So it becomes a kind of a colleague in the room. So this was part of the experimentation we were doing with the, uh, on the dissertation. So overall, the methodology that I wanted to, uh, to explain in this and that was meant to be a flow of it is that we, we had this embodiment of this target training situation. This was this I zone. 
I think of it as an operation center, a virtual world operation center, but to give an emo immersive and engaging user experience. And I wanted to have natural constraints from the scenario itself for what you can, can't do. So the interaction with this environment really gave you a, a realistic situation that gave you just those choices open to you that put you in this high quality learning point where you are in the zone, as we, 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 we might say, for what you can learn and what you can do and how we want to push you. And then we want to set up appropriate, realistic, challenging and motivational tasks or objectives that make it fun and make it engaging, exciting even uh, for the trainers involved. Making it realistic and making it challenging really challenges the sorts of people we're wanting to do. They're usually highly motivated emergency responders. We've worked with real emergency responders in these training exercises and in, the, in some of the simulations we've done. And they're driven by really having to make tough decisions because they realize it's good training and they realize it's, it's, it's exercising them in areas where in real life they wouldn't, they would hope, uh, get to take some of the hard decisions that we force them into, into taking. So we want to then carefully se select and inject scenario events into this environment so that we keep learners in this really highly motivated, effective, in the zone of learning, uh, for effective learning. So it's about inducing context-specific activity to get the learners to respond. So I'm just going to summarize this. And this is the methodology I want to, that, that I want to uh, uh, treat as the outcome of my MSc dissertation work. The idea is to constrain the world situation and the activities which are possible in this, in this environment, and then select or generate, perhaps semi-automatically, relevant tasks and event, events, and then eject these into the learning situation to keep learners in this learning zone of highly effective, highly motivated, hard learning, where they're, mo they're, they're learning most and getting most out of the training that we're trying to give them. So we want to induce appropriate learner activity in context to do this. So I'll just repeat the URL for you. Hopefully that's even viewable on the Ustream to people watching live and on the later recordings. Um, it's http colon slash slash 88.org slash OSCC13. And we're going to make sure that the uh, full MSc dissertation and resources continue to be available at that URL. So thanks very much. And thank you so so very much, uh, I, I Austin. Uh, at this time, uh, do we have any uh, questions uh, from the audience? Okay, it looks like we have nothing. I just thank uh, everyone here for uh, coming to the session and thank you again to our uh, presenter, Austin Tate, for an excellent uh, presentation. Right, thank you and thanks, Shirley. Thank you for coming. Whoops, we have a question after all. Uh, go ahead, uh, Tom. I'll repeat your question, Tom, if you just want to oh. give it, uh, put it in chat. Okay, thanks, Shirley. But uh, we need to, Tom, uh, uh, Krista, do you want to, uh, ah, right, okay, I've, I've got Krista's question. Shall I read that out, Shirley? How many of these learning scenarios did you do so far? So I'll come back to Tom's in a minute, but how many of these learning scenarios did you do so far? So the, uh, the, the work that preceded this was on the open virtual collaboration environment project 
open vce um we'd led to some of the uh of the assets and the uh, the OpenSIM archive files, for instance, the open source ones were created with Clever Zebra um, and made those available in open source. That work was done with US Joint Forces Command in, originally and the US Army uh, Research Labs, their uh, Human Resources uh, Experimentation Depart uh, Division. And that was done with a community of uh, emergency responders, um, uh, two sets, and we did two week long scenario experiments for that. And that's fully documented, resources available, uh, the data was made available at, 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 it, you know, in, in a public way and has been written up and, and published in a number of journals, including IEEE Intelligent Systems. So that was two week-long exercises. And that's the, that's the main of the actual experimentation we've done with humans involved, with people who we're trying it out with. Um, I explained that we'd worked on two other projects. We had two, three man month projects which were funded by e e eu grants european union grants uh, one with slam games in glasgow which took place over a three-month period and one of these areas scenario-based areas was created that way uh, and the virtual world of whiskey now in terms of my own dissertation i didn't do any actual experimentation further experimentation with other people we drew on that previous work as a community uh, since this has taken place, we've worked with a f on a further project with the U.S. Army, um, which has been for the dismounted infantry collaboration environment work. That's what that work's done with Jeff Hansberger um, uh, over in the U.S. Army uh, Research Labs HRED division, and that again has not actually had an experiment involved with it. It was it, it was a uh, the development of the resources in order that they could be used. Our role on the project has been to create the virtual world and intelligent systems and web portal elements that then could be used by the experimenters themselves for their experiments. Okay, thanks, Krista. Uh, let's go back to Tom's question. How does the system cope with emotional responses of the participants? Well, I don't think I've got an answer to that. The emotional responses. So I think I'm going to need Tom to explain a little bit more about what he's looking for in terms of that. If, if you're meaning in terms of uh, trying to respond to whether they're stressed and things of that kind, is that what you mean? And whether we're putting them under stress indeed. I see Tom typing away. Yeah, so if, it, if it's to do with that, I, I don't think I have an, a, a good answer for you. Um, we're, we, we're effectively trying to ensure that the folks, the, the folks are given interesting, challenging, and highly motivational tasks. I've not looked at all about uh, the, the issues of of stress and levels of, of attention, levels of, of excitement in, in, in our work at all. Uh, I should say the work, the way we, and Chris, related back to Krista's question, the work we've done that, I, I'm not a, a human experimenter or a social scientist, so in my work I've tended to provide an underpinning, a technology, a platform, a framework that can be used in these experiments and then I team up with other people who are the human experimental psychologists who are doing the actual experimentation. So when we did the world, uh, the uh, whole of uh, uh, the, the whole of society crisis response community work, WASCA, uh, project work that was funded by the U.S. Joint Forces Command and U.S. Army, the H. Red people themselves at the U.S. Army Research Laboratory, their human psychologists, did, actually did the experimentation and actually did all of the analysis of that and did the publications on that. Okay, we have another question coming in from Krista, I think. Just to comment on something that Tom's saying about the white room or the white cell, it's sometimes called in military training. Uh, this is important, this, this, this air, uh, idea that you've got, uh, they call it white cell, I think, because they typically in a military situation, they might have red forces and blue forces, you know, friendly and, and enemy forces, and they're, they're often trying to kind of create scenarios. And the white, the white cell is, is there to, 
to to be the the people trying to keep people in this learning environment and trying to drive the simulation forward they typically inject events and they have a master scenario events list it's typically called uh, where they they take things off the list and put it in at appropriate times to keep people driving along and this my approach is very much motivated by that idea of trying to put things in at appropriate times that are correct and seemingly right. Um, I've been involved in, in something many years ago uh, where we, with Rediffusion simulators on a, on a project in the UK, on the Alvi program in the UK, where we were dealing with uh, p uh, people who've been trained for navigation of, of ships in the English Channel off the, the south coast of the, the, of, of the UK. And the idea was to put them into a situation where they had to respond as other boats came around them. And if the, if the people being trained typically got out of the situation too quickly, you tried to put them back in it by, by forcing them into situations where it was becoming more of an emergency, more dangerous, and they had to properly learn how to control their boats and how long they took to turn. And in, in that case, the people who had been trained, typically there'd only be one person who was, who was commanding the boat, and you might have had 20 or 30 other people controlling all of the various craft around them. And this idea that you can uh, use AI systems and automate, partially automated systems to generate a plausible set of, of behaviors of these other agents is something that I'm really trying to emulate in this next work. Okay, I've got a question, question from Krista. I'll just read it out. In your MSc studies, did you compare any of this to MOOCs? Or is that even comparable with MOOC because MOOCs have zero awareness? Well, I actually do do uh, myself uh, do a MOOC on AI planning uh, with the on the Coursera platform that we started last year. Um, any of you are welcome to join in that if you're interested because we're repeating it again coming up in January 2014. So I'm. I didn't, I didn't do any relationship at all between the MSc studies and the MOOCs, but I do have an observation. I don't think MOOCs have zero awareness. Uh, MOOCs aren't something that are just posted online. Uh, MOOCs do have people behind them. They have the tutors behind them. And a lot of us who are interested in, in social learning and, and collaborative learning and community-oriented learning through MOOCs, uh, you know, see MOOCs rather than the, the sort of publish and let it go kind of MOOCs, um, really treat it as a social event. Uh, so they they don't have zero awareness in my view because we're we're, we're there as tutors we're there as as as, as professors and we're there as uh, teaching assistants uh, trying to keep it interesting and on our own MOOC for instance we definitely had a community of of, of twenty or thirty people from our, from the research community in AI planning who are all heavily involved and heavily engaged with our students um, so. I don't think I would directly compare it, Christo, but uh, I certainly wouldn't say MOOCs typically would have zero awareness either. Okay. Thank you again, uh, Professor Tate. And uh, Okay, thanks. At, at this point, we have to uh, wrap up. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And uh, you know, we hope you enjoy uh, your rest of the day at the OSCC. Thank you. Thanks, Shirley.